Um, numbers, uh, so, so number 17 continues that story. And here's what we have. In Numbers chapter 17, I'll, I'll give you Numbers chapter 18 in a few minutes. But Numbers chapter 17, we're going to see proof of Aaron's calling. I'll, I'll tell you what that's all. It's like, who's Aaron and who's calling him? Okay? Why, why do we have proof of Aaron's calling? But here, if you're taking notes, if you're one of the note takers, these are the three main divisions in this chapter. We're going to see God addressing complaints. We're going to see that Aaron was, in fact, the chosen person for his position. And we'll find out what that position is. And then we'll see at the end, the last couple of verses in this chapter, that the people were afraid. So addressing complaints, Aaron chosen, and then the people being afraid. But let's, let's tackle that first one, the first five verses, which is addressing complaints. And I'll, I'll read, and then I'll bring you up to speed, tell you what's going on. Verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses. This is what he said, verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel, and get from them a rod from each father's house. Now, what is a rod? And you're like, you know, my uncle was in a motorcycle accident, and he ended up with a rod in his leg. Is that what you're talking about? No, we're not talking about one of those titanium rods. But this would have been a stick. You say, really? God just wants them to bring a stick. This would have been a specific stick that would have been something like a cane or a staff, something that would have been uh, a tool to them, very common to them. And God says, I want each of the leaders to bring a rod. That's what he says in verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel, get from them a rod from each father's house. All their leaders, according to their father's houses, 12 rods, write each man's name on his rod. So, he says, I want there to be 12 rods, one from each family, from each leader of each family. Now, there were thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people out there in this camp. But God, being organized, because he's God and he's organized, he's got them divided up into different families or what they called tribes, and there are 12 of them. And so he says, each of these tribes, I want for them to bring a rod, one rod, that represents the leader of that family. Okay? And here's what he wants to do. Verse 3. And you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. So there was a family called Levi. Um, they ended up years later making jeans and jackets and things and I'm just kidding. They didn't really do that. Verse 3. And you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes. It's okay. Right? Sometimes you do that. Uh, verse 3. And you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. So, so he says uh, he's going to address complaints using rods. Okay? And then each rod is going to have somebody's name on it. Write their name on it. Okay? So it's like when you're going to camp. Okay, write your name on all your gear because it happens every time somebody leaves their sleeping bag or they leave their pillow. It's like they drove away and left their pillow sitting in the bark. How, why, how, like, what, like when you go home, what, you know, and you, and you go to sleep, like how do, you, how do you not realize, oh, I left my pillow? How do you not realize that? I don't know, maybe because you borrowed your brother's pillow and left it here. But you, they were to take these rods, write their name, and, and here's what they were supposed to do. Verse 4, he tells Moses, Then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. Now, what is the tabernacle of meeting? What is the testimony? What is going on here? Some of you are wondering, who is Aaron? Who's Moses? What's happening? God is speaking to this man, Moses. Okay? Now, just prior to this, they had a problem. There was this guy named Aaron. Moses and Aaron, they're partners, man. They're teamed up. God chose them for specific positions. Moses, he chose him to lead the children of Israel. Okay, you're going to be the leader. You're going to, they're, they're going to follow you. You're going to talk to them. God says you're going to be my spokesperson. Okay? And then there's this guy, Aaron. And Aaron was chosen by God to be the head priest. They had a priest. They had their own religion that God is developing here. And he says, you're going to be the head priest. Okay? Now, why did he choose those two guys? Probably, now we're never told, 
but he probably chose those two guys because he couldn't find anybody worse. That is no joke. That is oftentimes how God chooses people. See if, uh, you know, he chooses all of the most famous people and all the best athletes. What will happen oftentimes is those famous people and those athletes, they will end up taking all the glory from God because they're famous and they're beautiful people and they've got it all together and people will look at them and go, oh man, yeah, they're such beautiful people and that's them. But if God takes, if, if God will, will choose losers... Then people go, what? Like, how did you lead millions of people out of Egypt over to the... How did you do that, Moses? You're a loser. Moses was actually... Moses was actually... He had grown up in the house of Pharaoh in Egypt. He was a, he was a stepchild. He was a, he was a step-grandson to the Pharaoh. Step! And then Moses was actually a murderer. He had murdered a man buried him in the dirt, in the sand. And then he was a man that was filled with fear because he ran for his life. When they found out, Pharaoh's like, I'm, I'm coming to kill you. And he split, he took off. And, and when God found Moses, he was walking around on the backside of the wilderness, just out there in the middle of nowhere with his father-in-law's, he was married by that point, his father-in-law's flock of goats or sheep. That was what Moses was doing. Um, so, so Moses was, a, was I mean, by, by, by our standards, if we saw Moses today, prior to God choosing him, we'd go, man, that's a loser. Mm -hmm. Look, what is, I mean, what is he even doing? You know, he's ran for his life, he's a murderer, he walks around with a flock of goats. You know, who does that? <laughs> you know, but that's who God chose. And that's oftentimes how God works. Now, does God choose famous people from time to time or beautiful people or models? Sure he does. Yes, he does. Uh, but oftentimes this is not uncommon for him to choose people that's just like, I, I don't know why you got them, but God knows exactly why he got them. Now, so he chose Moses and he chose Aaron for these positions. Well, Aaron was the priest. And what had happened just before this is that there was this guy named Korah. And Korah had his little posse with him. And they came and complained about Moses and Aaron. But here's what was going on is Korah was starting trouble because he wanted Aaron's position. He wanted to be the high priest. He wasn't content with just serving God and that second class position of being a Levite. We'll talk about that, what that means to be a Levite in a little while. But, but he wanted to have the top spot. Well, um, God distinguished between the two and he actually ended up, God actually ended up killing Korah because he was trying to take Aaron's position. Well, the day after God killed Korah, the day, the day after, people complained again and they said, you know what, uh, Moses, you killed those people and Moses like, I didn't do it, God did it, but they're blaming Moses. And they're saying, you know, you killed these people. And so what God is doing now, now this brings us up to chapter 17. What God is, why are we, what's with the rods? What's with Aaron? What's with the 12 people? What's going on? What God is going to do is he's going to use these rods, these 12 rods, to once and for all announce to all the people that Aaron is the right man for that job. And basically, back off. Verse 3. You shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, for there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Uh, uh, father's house. Then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting. What is the tabernacle? It was their temporary church, basically, their temporary place of worship. It was made out of. It was a tent, had uh, only a few walls, and the rest was curtains and material and uh, goat skins and different things. Okay, and he says you're going to take all these rods. You're going to take them into that place, and in verse four. You're going to put them before the testimony. That would be the Ark of the Covenant. This was a special box that God had previously told them to make. And uh, it was a box that they were going to put things, some things in. You know, they weren't just going to store like their chonies or anything like that. But they were going to have specific items that God told them to put in there. Okay. 
And, and so we're going to find out that one of these rods is going to go in there, but don't get there yet. Okay. So God says that's, that box is special. God had said, you make this box and this is, I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to meet you around that box. I'll be there. So it's a big deal. Have you ever seen Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark. How many of you have seen that? Anybody? Okay. The other half of you are like, no, I'm a Christian. That's a sinful movie. I don't watch that. But, but anyhow, that you get an idea. There's like the Ark of the Covenant. But, but um, so God says, you bring these, these rods and you lay them before the testimony. Lay them there. He's going to do something special. And in verse 5, okay, now I messed up here a little bit, not a big deal, but I said rid myself, and I'm not ridding myself of anything. God was going to rid himself. So what I should have put was rid himself. God told him to bring the rods. God is going to rid himself of what? Well, let's find out in verse 5. And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. What? It's going to blossom. Thus, I will rid myself, this is God speaking, I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you, speaking to uh, Moses. So what God is saying is, I'm tired of listening to their complaints. I'm going to rid myself of those complaints. I don't want to hear it. Just stop. And he's going to stop it. Okay, this is his way of stopping it. You know, some of you have been with your parents, you know, your dad, and you're in the car, and you know, your little brother or little sister get in there, right? And they always, you know, everybody's always fighting over shotgun, shotgun, shotgun. I got I call shotgun for the next 20 years, you know, and you're just like, you gotta have shotgun, you know, you want your spot. You know, maybe it's 118 degrees outside, and you're like, no, that's the best air conditioning. Whatever your reason is, you know, you've got your reason, but there's fighting, and then your dad's like, hey, I don't want to hear it. Or your mom's just like, knock it off. I don't want to hear it. Just stop. I don't want to hear you complaining. Okay? Get the chancla. <laughs> right? But I don't want to hear it. Well, God is here saying, I don't want to hear your complaints anymore, and so we're going to do something about it, and this is what God came up with. We're going to have these rods, and one of them's going to blossom, and whoever's, it's got his name on it, when it blossoms, you're going to know something special happened. That's God's choice. So, as you can imagine, what happens, here's our next section, verses 6 through 11, Aaron is chosen. Wow, what a surprise. He had been chosen already. God hasn't changed his mind. Okay, God doesn't change his mind. God's got this plan. He's got it all worked out. So in verse 6, beginning at verse 6, we see that the rods are collected. So Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's houses, 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods, just thrown in there with the rest. And Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. So he put it in there inside of their tabernacle or that tent, their place of worship. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses, the very next day, that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron, of the house of Levi, had sprouted, check this out, it sprouted, put forth buds, had produced blossoms, and yielded ripe almonds. Oh, man, that sounds good. You like almonds? Who likes almonds? Okay, yes, fresh almonds, right? Unsalted almonds or salted whatever, but almonds, good stuff. Well, God, overnight, he performs a miracle. This is what this is. This is a miracle. And he caused Aaron's rod to blossom, to bloom there. It says that it sprouted and brought forth buds and blossoms, and it yielded ripe almonds. Not just almonds, but ripe almonds. These things were ready to pick off of there and eat. So God here is making a distinction between Aaron and everybody else. Now, what this means is that God only loves Aaron and hates everybody else, right? No. All he, that God is determining is who's supposed to be in charge of the priest. That's all that's being determined here. But that was being challenged. So God is making that clear. Verse 8, um, rather verse 9, sorry. Then Moses brought 
out all the rods from before the Lord to all the children of Israel. And they looked, and each man took his rod and walked away. So sad, right? L7, right? All of them, they came and pick up their rods. And say, oh, man, I'm not chosen by God. And they pick up their rod and walk away. And everybody sees Aaron's rod, and they go, oh, man, look at Aaron's rod. He's the one that's been chosen by God. And in verses 10 and 11, it says, we get this reminder here, and the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony. So bring it back in to be kept as a sign against the rebels. Against the rebels. Now, if you're you know, into Star Wars, it's good to be a rebel. Okay, but when it comes to God and, and um, uh, being in, in a relationship with God, it's bad to rebel against God. So he says there that this, this uh, uh, rod of Aaron is going to be kept. Aaron doesn't get it back. Isn't that funny? Because Aaron could have been like, hey, you know, walk around town, like check out my rod, man. You know, and everybody can see that it's got almonds on or whatever. You know, maybe stop and pick one off and... <laughs> Yeah, that's right. God gave this to me. And, you know, maybe maybe make it really clear to everybody. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, this is who I am. But God says, no, you cannot keep that thing. You cannot keep that. It probably would have become a source of worship, might have distracted people. That's not Aaron's job. Aaron's job is to point people to God. It's not to take all the glory, not to take all the credit, not to get all the attention, but to point them to God. So it's possible that God says, hey, I'm, I'm taking that not only to be a reminder, but to keep you, Aaron, from, you know, getting a fat head or whatever. And so he takes this, it says in verse 10, is to be kept as a sign against the rebels. In other words, a reminder. Look at this in verse 10, that you may put their complaints away from me, lest they die. That's pretty serious. I mean, it's obvious to us, and this is one of the good things that I love about reading through the Old Testament, as you get an idea of who God is. And God evidently does not like complaining because he said, let, let this be a reminder because if they keep complaining, they're going to die. So basically God's saying, you keep complaining to me and I'm going to kill you. That's pretty serious. Now, all of us in here have complained to God at least one million times. I know that I have. I know that over the years of being a Christian, and I've been a Christian now for, uh, how old am I? For like 29 years. I know that I have complained to God countless times. I'm quite the expert at it. But I know God doesn't like it, and I ought not be ungrateful and complaining to God, but this is a stark reminder right? It's like you can't get around this one. There's no, you know, there's no like, well, maybe, you know, maybe God doesn't so much mind complaints. No, it says here, God tells his own people, you keep complaining and I'll kill you. So Moses, you better tell them that. Keep the rod as a reminder. Every time they see it, ah, oh, I better not complain because God might kill me. Okay, so, so that's what this rod was supposed to do, was supposed to be a reminder for them. But it's just, there's a basic principle here that God doesn't like me complaining to him. I ought not be complaining. I should be grateful, thankful for the things that I have. Believe it or not, even the bad things. You ever heard the story of Corey Ten Boom? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? If you've never heard this story, you've got to look this lady up. Corey Ten Boom. Uh, she was um, uh, captured by uh, not the Nazis during World War II, but her and her sister they were share they were in the um, concentration camp, but they were Christians and they were trying to share the gospel with all of the Jewish ladies that were in there, uh, even in the midst of all this. And uh, I think it was her sister one time. I don't think it was Corey. I think it was her sister. As they were praying, the sister was like, uh, you know what, God, I'd like to thank you for uh, the body lice. I think it was, uh, they had body lice and it was like, it was body lice. I'd like to thank you for the body lice. And her sister's like, what do you, why would you be thankful for body lice? You know, and, and it was like, you know, it's just, we gotta be thankful for everything. Well, it turned out that the guards, the Nazi guards, because of the infestation of lice inside of the barracks where these women were housed, because it was so bad, the Nazi guards wouldn't come into that place. They're like, I'm not going in there. It's infested with body lice. Because of that, because the guards wouldn't come in, 
They had the freedom to continue preaching the gospel and seeing women get saved, Jewish women getting saved during World War II. Incredible. So it's like, who would be thankful for the bad things? But God uses everything, right? And whatever God determines, that's, listen, I want to be, I want to be satisfied with that. So, what a reminder. Wow. But let's look at this last section. It's just two verses, 12 and 13. They were afraid. The people were. Verse 12. So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, and they said, Surely we die. I mean, they're like, they're like, oh, I complain all the time. I'm going to die. You know? <laughs> Can you, like, like some, of you, some of you, you play video games, you know, you're like, you're a gamer. And you just know there's just sometimes where you're just like, no, I'm just going to die. I just know it. Right? Uh, you get... You get dropped in or you respawn or whatever, and you're just like, no, I'm just, I'm, I know I'm going to die, okay? You could be playing Super Mario or whatever, but there's just a point where you know, like, there's, there's no going back, I'm dead, okay? These guys were like, hey, I'm, I'm, I, they're like, they heard that, they're like, man, you keep complaining, you're going to die, and they're just like, surely we die, we perish, we're, we're, we're all going to die. Because they understood the attitude of their heart that they were complainers. And, and for many of us, that's in our nature. We complain. We complain about things. Nothing's ever right. Nothing is ever satisfactory. You know, I you know, never have the right food, or it's never the right shoes, or it's never the right teacher, or it's never the right uh, you know, weather, or it's never the right beach, or it's you know, it's, it's, for some of us it's in our nature, like man, we're just always complaining about things. And evidently this group knew, man, we, we complain a lot, I think we're all dead people. Verse 13, whoever even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Shall we all utterly die? So they, they realized, man, they got the point like, oh, man, this is so scary. But you see, let me point something out before we get into Numbers chapter 18. Before we get into Numbers chapter 18. And that is this. The people are in this position by their own choosing. You see, what God had done was, he had told Moses, okay, I'm getting you to the promised land. I'm getting you to a land that's it's going to have everything you need. All you got to do is just, you just got to go in. Everybody just go in and you just, you just take what's there. Um, they got to the border. They sent spies in, 12 of them. Let's go check out the land before we go in. They came back and they said, we can't go in. And essentially they said, God's lying. We don't believe him. Because there's giants in the land, and they're going to kill us if we go in, so we can't go in. And they made that own decision. They made that decision on their own. They decided we're not going to live by faith. Instead, we're going to live by fear. Well, let me ask you a question. This is a rhetorical question. Everybody knows the answer. We've all experienced it. But what happens when you do not trust God? You live in fear. And sometimes that fear, even for those of us that are Christians, even for those of us that are Christians, sometimes we allow our fear to overcome our faith. And those are those nights when you're sleepless, when you're worried, when you're tossing and you're turning and you're tossing and you're turning and you finally get up in the morning, you haven't had any sleep and you don't feel like eating because your stomach is just in knots. And you go to school and you got a test and you're trying to concentrate, but you can't concentrate because your mind is just cranking. The gears in there are cranking because all you can think about is this situation that you're fearful of. All of those things are a result of us not trusting God. When we do not trust God, when we do not live by faith, what happens is fear overwhelms us. And living in fear is no fun at all. And these people are living in fear because they would not trust God. There was no rest in their lives. No rest. They can't, they can't be settled. They're just, they're, they're, they're always uneasy. And this is the reason why the name of this or the title of our series is what? I'm going all the way back. It is wanderers because this story is the story of people who do not live by faith. Yes, they're God's people, but they chose not to live by faith. And because of that, they're always wandering 
the wilderness. In fact, this group of people that we're talking about will be wandering the wilderness for 40 years because they wouldn't trust God. And for some of us, that's how our lives are right now. It's like we're just wandering. Like, I don't really know where I'm going, what I'm doing, and I don't know where I'm going to go and what's happening, and I'm not sure what's going to happen in this situation. And, you know, this thing going on with mom or dad or with my brothers or with my aunt or my friends or things at school. Or uh, I, I just, I don't, you're, and you're just never settled. Your heart is never at ease. And then there are those who have learned a very simple but valuable secret to, you know what, I'm just going to trust God, man. The world is falling apart. Things are going crazy. Maybe your family is falling apart. But you know what, I'm just going to trust God. I don't know what he's doing. Seems crazy to me, but I'm going to trust God. And then your heart is filled with peace. And nobody can figure out why. Like, man, what do you, you know, these things are going on in your family or in your life and you've got these struggles and these complications and all these problems and you're just like, you're just in cruise control. Like, how do you do that? I don't, I'm just trusting God. Like, I don't know. I just decided I'm going to trust God. And so your heart is not wandering. Your heart is steady. Your heart has found peace with God. That's what we're, this is the, the, the lesson that we are learning here through the mistakes of these people. So these people are living in fear. We don't want to be that way. The key to that is to trust God. Oh, sounds too easy. Well, what else are you going to do? You better get a really good job because you're going to need to pay that therapist thousands and thousands of dollars in order for you to find some peace. And the peace is probably going to come in the form of a pill that they're going to give you. And it probably still won't bring the only thing that's going to put your heart at ease, the only thing that's going to give you genuine peace in the midst of all this mess is trusting God. That's the hard lesson that these people are learning. Numbers chapter 18. Let's go ahead and cover this one too. We're going to move through it quickly and finish this up here. Numbers chapter 18. There's a lot here, but we will not read all of it. Um, I'll give you, I'll just kind of um, uh uh, give you an overview of some of these areas. But here's the deal. This is provisions for the priests and Levites. Now, this is how the book of Numbers is, is laid out. Sometimes you get these crazy stories like the, the budding of Aaron's rod, oh, man, this is real. And, and then the next chapter is like, okay, I've got a bunch of rules for you. Wait, what, what happened to the flow? But this is how it was written. It's not for us to complain about because we might die. Okay, so let's just take what's here. Numbers chapter 18 is about provisions for the priests and Levites. Let, let me, let me before we get into talking about priests and Levites, let me ask, I'm just going to throw a question out there, something for you to think about. How does Pastor Chris, anybody in here know Pastor Chris? Okay, if you don't, now you do, because he's me, okay? <laughs> I'm a pastor. I, I do this full time. Uh, my schedule is Sunday to Thursday here on Sundays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, okay? Um, so right now, I want you to ask yourself, like, okay, so how does he, like, have money to, like, do things or buy those stupid shirts? Like, what does he, I don't, what does he, how does he, what does he, like, how does he live? He's a pastor? Like, what do you do? Okay, so we'll talk about that, but the principles are the same. Numbers chapter 18, we're going to see provisions for the priests, for the Levites. Who are the Levites? We'll talk about that. And then we'll see provisions from the Levites. Okay? But let's look at how God provided for the priests. Let's read verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house, see, that's everybody in the family, with you, shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. He says, he says you guys, Aaron and Aaron's sons who were the priests, you're going to bear the sins of the sanctuary. In other words, the weight of being a priest is all going to be on you, Aaron and your sons. Now, Let's bring this. We're going to go back and forth. I'm going to tell you about this, and then I'm going to uh, uh, give you an example from our modern, our present time. Okay? I'm not a priest. Uh, that's not my title. My title would be pastor. Okay? But the principles are the same. 
what God is telling Aaron there is like, hey, you're, you're going to be a priest. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal. But along with being a priest, you're going to have to bear the weight of all of that. It's a heavy, it's a heavy job. It, by heavy, here's what I mean. I want you to think about this in terms of a pastor. What does a pastor do? Okay. Well, if you belong to Calvary Chapel like we do, it probably surf all week, right? Spend a few minutes putting a study together or just steal one from online or something. You know, just get somebody else's or whatever, okay? Um, or, you know, maybe you practice your golf, you know, or sleep in or, you know, I don't know. What, what do pastors do during the week? It's a great question, okay? What he's saying is, okay, pastors, or we might even see, say church leaders. Maybe it's not a pastor. Maybe it's a, some other ministry leader. Maybe it's a worship leader. Maybe it's a, a women's ministry leader, some other kind of leader, okay, in the church. What he's saying is, okay, you leaders, you're going to carry a heavier load than everybody else because of your position. Okay, so here's what I mean. Uh, there have been lots and lots of times since I've been involved in ministry for a lot of years where I have been pulled away from my family for different things. Uh, just to give you an example, many years ago, uh, my wife and I had some concert tickets to go to a concert. I do not remember who it was, okay? Metallica or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't hear something. But, but I don't remember who it was. But we were planning to go, and then I got a phone call. And it was about one of my former students, this family. They're still friends. To this day, they're still friends. Pastor Chris, please, you got to come to the hospital. Here's what happened with our son. And he's basically on his deathbed. So concerts off to the hospital I go. Now I told you that just to give you an example of how godly I am. Just kidding. I, that was a What was I going to do? Was I going to tell this mom, ah, I can't come see your son, I'm going to a concert? No. The concert gets dropped because it's not nearly as important as this family of friends and this young man. And so that's, I'm just giving you a little example to show you that being a pastor with that comes a lot of responsibility. There have been other, lots of other, I don't know, I've been on countless hospital calls. I don't remember how many. I, maybe it's, I don't think it's in the hundreds, but it's a lot, I mean, just a lot of, I don't remember how many. Uh, weddings, you know, and funerals, and just all those, you know, counseling, all those different things. There's a lot of extra time that goes into, so my schedule is Sunday to Thursday, but this last Friday, a couple days ago, I was working all day, ministry stuff. It just goes along with the job. So this is a little taste. When, when God says to them, listen, uh, you're going to, he tells the priest, like you're going to bear the, 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 the sin or you're going to bear the weight of it. What he's saying is this is a big responsibility. And you're going to feel the heaviness of it. There's a lot of responsibility that goes along with that. And so because they are doing this important job, and again, God chose them. They didn't submit an application they just, this is what God told them to do. So he says in verse 2, God says, I'm going to provide some things for you because there are hazards that go along with the job. Verse 2, he tells them, I'm actually going to give you the Levites. Verse 2, also bring with you your brethren, the brothers, your family of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve you while you and your sons are with you before the tabernacle of witness. So they, the Levites, the family of Levi, they were going to assist the priests. That was their job. Skip down to verse 6. God says, Behold, I myself have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. They are a gift to you. See there? So he provided for the priests. It gave them some help. He says, I'm going to give you the family, the, the Levites. They're not priests, but they are assistants, and they're going to help you out. Okay? Um, in here, we've got some leaders in here, some adult leaders in here. And uh, Zach there in the back, and we've got the Perrys in the back, and we've got Miss Lisa there. Even Jaden in the back is working sound for us. Hi, Jaden. Uh, all of these people they assist me, okay? They assist me. I need lots of assistance. <laughs> I got lots of issues. need lots of assistance. They assist me. 
That was the Levites. They were going to assist the priests. And God provided some help for them. But, but also there's a second thing that God provided for them. And that was that God provided the priesthood. He gave them some purpose. Verse 7. Therefore, you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil. And you shall serve. I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service. So God was actually giving them that position. This is what God does. He gives us purpose in our lives. Okay? People without purpose become hopeless. God says, I'm giving you purpose. He provided a purpose for them uh, for, for their lives. Okay? What's the next thing? This was a good one. Heave offerings. Okay? Because here's the deal. Okay, I see I'm so I'm serving, I'm I'm offering sacrifices, and basically there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people in the camp. They bring their animals to Aaron to be sacrificed. So Aaron's going to be busy all day long offering sacrifices. So how's Aaron supposed to, like, eat? How's he supposed to, and then, and then if Aaron's got a wife, or if his sons are helping him and they have families, like, how are they supposed to eat if Aaron is working uh, all the time for God, but he's not getting paid? Like, what, what are they, how are they supposed to do that? Well, that's what this is all about, God's provisions for these people. And here in this section, beginning at verse 8, uh, he tells them, I'm going to give you heave offerings. If you, if you skip down to verse 11, this also is yours the heave offering of their gift with all the wave offerings. I have given them to you, he says in verse 11, and your sons and your daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Wash your hands. That's not what, he's not talking about washing your hands, but what he's saying is if, if they've gone through the ceremony and been cleansed, uh, it was somewhat easy. You know, they just got to go through the ceremony. They can eat these things. But, but here's the way this works, in case you're not aware of what's going on. The heave offering or the wave offering, these were offerings that people would give to the Lord. And what would happen is God is, is here telling them, and he will continue to go on to tell them, that they're going to get certain offerings. Certain offerings, so let's say I was going to bring uh, this uh, beautiful uh, study packet for the uh, incoming ninth grade girls, okay? It's pink. So we don't need these things, guys, right? Tough. I like pink. Pink's great. Anyhow, um, so, so let's say I was going to offer this to the Lord as a heave offering. I would bring it, and I would go in and just, I'm making this real quick. I would heave it up to the Lord. I would just say, Lord, this is yours. And then what God is saying is, then that goes to the priests. And the priests can partake or eat from that. And they can even feed their families from it. There's something called a wave offering, too, that would be waved in front of the Lord, symbolically, and then given to the priests. So God here is providing. Through their work, through that ministry, that job that they're doing, God is providing for them. Guess what? Now we go back to that question. How exactly does Pastor Chris pay for a haircut? Like, what does he, does he go to the barber and perform some priestly duty for a haircut? Uh, you know, I'll offer a sacrifice for you, barber, if you just give me a haircut. Like, how does he do that? What does he, I go in there and I pay with money. I've got at home, I've got, uh, I actually do have a home. Uh, uh, the Perry's smallest daughter, Alex, is a sweetheart. Um, she, one time we were leaving and we were both getting in the vehicles and they were getting in their little minivan, I'm getting in my car. And she's just looking at me like, we're like best friends basically. But she's looking at me so confused. She's, she's like, she goes, where, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And she was even more confused, like, hey, where's your home? See, she was thinking, every time I go to that church, I see that guy. He must live at the church. That's what she was thinking. I must live here, like in the little back room or something. Where do I live? But I actually have a home. And when it's 152 degrees out, I turn on the air conditioner. But I, I pay for my bill with money. I uh, pay for my haircuts with money. I, uh, you know, when I need new clothes or I got to put gas in my little car or whatever, I pay with money. How do I do that? Where does that money come from? 
Does God, you know, do you just wake up in the morning and it's like Aaron's rod buddy and there's just money there? Like, how does God do that? It comes from the money that people give to the church. And you go, ah, I knew you guys were cheating everybody, still in their money. No, the people that give to the church, they know that the money's being used to pay me and to pay the other people that are on staff, guys and men and women, people that are on staff. And then there's a portion of that money that goes to pay for carpet, pays for lights, pays for sound, pays for TVs, pays for all of these things. So all the money gets divvied up to different things and portions of that, small portions of that go to the different people that are on staff, the pastors and other people that are on staff at the church. So I get paid from people giving. See, same principle. God is saying, people give, and God says, I'm going to give you a portion of that. You're going to get some of that. Some of it, God says, is going to go to me. It's going to get burned. But there's going to be a portion that goes to you, priests. So God is providing for his people through what other people give. That's the way that it works. Now, in verse 12, he talks about the best and the first. I love this section. For me, this is so exciting. Verse 12, all God, this is God speaking. All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine. Yes, they had wine. And the grain. Their first fruits, which they offered to the Lord, I have given them to you, God says. I'm giving those things to you. Verse 13, whatever first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, shall be yours. Verse 14, every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Verse 15, everything that first opens the womb, in other words, the firstborn of all flesh, it's yours. Now, he does go on to say, you know, they don't keep people, okay? But if you, your firstborn son, you would bring that firstborn son to the Lord, and basically it was like a heave offering. You would say, Lord, I dedicate this little child to you, but then you would take your little brat back home, okay? You wouldn't leave him there for the priest, you know? But you would take that little beautiful little baby back home. And so he talks there about redeeming them. They would give a portion of money in, in, uh, in place of that little baby, a firstborn baby. Or even there were unclean animals that couldn't be given to the Lord, but you would, instead, you would give a portion of money in place of that animal, okay? And so he talks about that in verses 15 and 16. But look at this in verse 17. But the firstborn of a cow, the firstborn of a sheep, you get some hamburger, you get some lamb chops. Or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. And their flesh shall be yours. See that? So, so the, the, any cows that were dedicated to the Lord or sheep that were offered or goats, he says, you, that, that belongs to you. You get some of that. So that's how they were able to sustain themselves and their families. Verse 18, and their flesh shall be yours. Verse 19, all the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offered to the Lord, I have given to you and to your sons and daughters. And I love this in verse 19. Look at this. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. This is actually a beautiful, this covenant of salt, that little phrase. Just about done here. Just about done. Covenant of salt. It's actually a beautiful thing. Let me read something to you from somebody that was much smarter than me. As salt was regarded as a necessary ingredient of the daily food, and so of all sacrifices offered to God, it became an easy step to the very close connection between salt and covenant making. When men or people, when people ate together, they became friends. Doesn't that so many times seal the deal? If you're at school and you meet somebody new and you're kind of like, ah, you know, I'm not really sure. I kind of might, might like this person. They might be kind of, we might be friends. I'm not really sure. And you're like, hey, what lunch you got? First or second? I got first. Oh, I got first. You want to eat together? Yeah, dude, let's do it. And then you're like, there's, there's the hookup there. Your friends, like, because you ate together, you know, you, 
ate that junk food together. And they're like, yeah, all right. You know, we're, we're, well, that's the same thing. He says, compare the Arabic expression. This is an old saying. Here's what it says. There is salt between us. He has eaten my salt, which means partaking of hospitality, which cemented the friendship. This is funny. This is kind of funny for us. Because if I were to say to you, hey, why are you being so salty? You'd be like, what? Oh, no, no, no. Because for us, that means like having a bad attitude. Like you're all bitter. Like why are you, you know, why are you all jealous? You know, why are you being so salty, man? Right? But here, it's a sweet thing. There's salt between us. That meant we're friends. It's like, wait, you're friends with that girl? Yeah. There's salt between us. Yeah, we've shared salt. He goes on to say, covenants, that's agreements, were generally confirmed by sacrificed meals and salt was always present. Since, too, salt is a preservative, it would easily become symbolic of an enduring covenant or an enduring friendship. So offerings to God were to be as a statute forever, a covenant of salt forever before God. Now, knowing that, we think back to what God said. What did God say to his people? This will be a covenant of salt between us. See, this is, people will say, well, in the Old Testament, you know, I like the New Testament better because God was gentle and he was kind and he was sweet, you know. And in the Old Testament, you know, he was just so mean and, you know, always killing people and there was always judgment. But here's one of those instances where God was very, very sweet. And he's saying to his people, he's saying, you and I are friends. This is what God offers to each of us friendship, a covenant of salt, an agreement. God offers to each one of us a friendship. He says, you and I, him being the creator of the universe, says, I want to be friends with you. And he offers that he extends his hands to you through the work of Jesus. He said, hey, if you, if you believe what I did here through Jesus, then you and I can be friends. Have a meal together. There's salt between us. So what a sweet phrase. Look at verse 20. Then the Lord said to Aaron, the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land. In other words, Aaron, the priest, you're not going to get a piece of land promised to you. Nor shall you have any portion among them. But look at this. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. I mean, it, it would be better to be homeless and have a relationship with God than to live in a palace and not. Aaron got the best. He's, he, won't, he won't be homeless. He's going to be provided for. But his, his, his inheritance is God. Incredible. And then finally, uh, let's move to these last two real quickly. Uh, what about for the Levites? Remember, they were the servants. Verse 21 Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes. A tithe would be a tenth. They're going to get a small portion. Again in verse 24, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites. So, so even the Levites were going to be provided for. They would get a small portion. And then finally, sorry, for the Levites, tithes. What about from the Levites? Guess what? Tithes. And this is where we finish because in verse uh, 26, at the end, he says, Then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And so the Levites were actually required to give, they would, now remember, they would get a tenth of a certain amount. And God says, I want you to take a tenth of that, and I want you to offer it up as a heave offering that will eventually go to the priests. So they would actually give also a tithe or a small piece. In verse 30, therefore you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites. So they get that. Verse 31, you may eat it in any place. It doesn't have to be eaten in the tabernacle. Levites, you can take that food back to your family and they can eat it. And he tells them at the end, just don't be disrespectful with it. Remember that people gave that. So listen, I don't take money that I've been given from the church that people have paid 
I'm like, woo, payday, I'm going to the casino. <laughs> Just to eat at the restaurants, of course. You know, I wouldn't do anything else, you know. But I, I don't do that. I don't take that money. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to go gamble it all and see if I can, you know, come on, double it up, baby. I don't do that. Because he says here, don't treat it disrespectfully. Verse 32, but you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. It's a biblical principle there. God provides something for you. Don't take it and just give it away uh, foolishly. you got to be careful. So I am thoughtful about the things that I do. And yeah, you know, uh, uh, there, there, there are, I mean, my family does, you know, we do some fun things. We, you know, we go to the beach or, you know, we go to a soccer game or whatever. We, we spend some money, but we're, we're not, you're, you know, I'm not out there living lavishly or gambling money. You know, you're not going to, you know, be driving to the store this week. And it's like, is that Pastor Chris rolling dice with those people in the, you know, in the back alley? You know, like, hey, come on. You know, I'm not doing that. Not doing that. I got to be mindful with how I'm using the money, and these people had to be also. But let's finish as we get ready to pray here. I just want to say, listen, God's offering all of us that same covenant of salt. He wants to be friends with you. Isn't that sweet. Isn't that sweet. What a sweet thing. Because it may be that everybody around us will fail us at one time or another, but we always have that friendship with God to go to, 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 to stand on. What a sweet thing. Father, thank you so much for this morning.